All right. Welcome back to the Gopher CEO channel. This is John the Bomb. Building others means business. And once again, it is like I just cherry pick these people. Uh, I'm actually super honored because this guy has a resume that is deeper than the ocean. <laughs> and this guy has done so many things. You're going to have so much fun. Gopher CEO community, learning from a serial entrepreneur, working with Fortune 500 companies, and so many different things that he teaches the teachers. That's how deep this guy is. So Michael Giuliano, welcome to the Gopher CEO channel. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me and hello to everybody listening. Thank you. Awesome, brother. Well, hey, man, we're going to have some fun. You said uh, it's kind of an open forum. And ladies and gentlemen, you're going to learn a lot about business, about mindset, about just creation, about operations and stuff like that. So we're going to go in all different places. So, you know, grab a piece of paper and a pen and start taking some notes because Michael's about to take us on a, a, on a quick journey here. So, Mike, why don't you just give a little bit of background? We kind of start with our interviewees with a little bit of background from your perspective, and then uh, we'll go flow from there. How far back you want me to go? Let's start with, um, you know, that first that first entrepreneurial endeavor, right? When you first okay. kind of set that mind up and what that thought pattern was. Yeah, um, uh, slightly before, it, which sets it up better probably is a um, little bit of a uh, little bit of a land of misfit toys, if you will. Um, I was a engineer. And I was also a division one athlete. So I played division one varsity football and I also studied engineering. So you usually don't get that mix. It's two ends mm -hmm. of the spectrum. Um, so I saw competition in both the classroom and I saw, you know, on the field against, you know, whoever we were playing that week. When I got out, I was a microchip engineer for Intel Corporation, and we were fortune number one at that time. And at that time, we were launching $8 billion per quarter out of a, uh, out of a very, or, yeah, we were launching 40 new products per quarter plus out of an $8 billion per quarter business. And that was uh, fortune number one when the stock doubled every year. I worked there and uh, the team I was a part of uh, enabled mobility. So everything was plugged in. And when I left, everything was Xbox, iPhone, iPod, dual core, quad core, eight core, server, wireless, all of that stuff. And I was there at the right time. Um, the opportunity was there. And we had an amazing team, not group of indi individuals, but team. And we had perhaps the most impressive person I've ever met or been around in my life, uh, Andy Grove, who was the founder. And uh, he used to tell us to put the wings on the pig, not the lipstick on the pig. And what we were making was the future. And that's the engine that drove everything that uh, went from a uh, two hour battery to all day, uh, being able to put these laptops in your pocket called iPhones and uh, all kinds of things and really changing people's religion and that uh, things they didn't think were, were possible, um, bringing them to life. I was there for a little bit more than four years, uh, did very well there, was very fortunate, great teams, great people, great people around us, great people in place. And uh, 27 years old, I said, if I can make it uh, fortune number one, and there's enough people tapping me on the shoulder that want me, not, what, not a version of me, but they're actually asking for me to come paint the painting or you know, do whatever. I said, I'm going to go try it. That was in a period of time, though, um, where if you left a corporate job in tech, you were mm -hmm. the dumbest person on earth. Your parents would ask you, "Do you, is there a problem? You know, do you, there was no such thing as entrepreneurship. Nobody called himself a CEO or a founder. You were just stupid if you did that. And so I was one of those. So that's how long ago it was. And uh, I immediately got jobs requested by name by Honda. Uh, Procter and Gamble, Johnson Johnson, Coca Cola, um, a lot of the Fortune 100, Fortune 50 in some cases, and was part of some new product development um, and some of the still some of the biggest launches in each industry. Period. Setting up the factories, setting up the products, down ramping old ones, up ramping new ones. Apple, um, and then continued that for a while. And after that, uh, ended up doing a little bit of work in the M&A community uh, for TPG and Blackstone, 
uh, got wow. got an eleven billion dollar profit and loss statement in my twenties, uh, late twenties, early thirties. Had a couple turnarounds that I worked on in private equity under my own name still, and um, then I started making my own stuff. Uh, and I made something. I turned it into a product and turned it into a factory, and then employed a lot of people. One hundred percent made in the U.S. And then sold that. And I've done that three more times. The most recent one was an electric vehicle company. It was the first roadworthy vehicle in the US, uh, electric two wheel uh, motorcycle. And it earned uh, GQ's best stuff of the year. Uh, so, one or two of the pictures out there somewhere on the internet that actually has me with a collared shirt on. Uh, that's from one of those fancy, fancy schmancy, one of those things. Other than that, I'm usually wearing sweats or something really comfortable and or jeans or steel toes and a pretty pedestrian dude. I love it. I love it. Well, look, man, you took us uh, on a voyage, just even the first a few minutes there. So, you know, one of the things that we do on the GoPro Studio channel is really try to learn, you know, how, how, how are you thinking in these moments, right? So you go through Intel, you, you've got a team, you start developing, obviously, you know, yourself, Mm -hmm. What are two things that you kind of brought out of Intel that really kind of then made you so marketable into the marketplace? Um, I would say it wasn't different. It was just, uh, it strongly reinforced something that you just don't know until you get out in the corporate world. So being an athlete, uh, I played baseball, basketball, football, and track. And then I played football in college, but I could have played other sports, but I played football. Um, it taught you that life's not fair. You can be the biggest, baddest state record holder, all time this, all time that. And then there's another level and everybody in the building. Yeah, me too. Right. I was the fastest person in Ohio. Well, I'm the fastest person in Florida. Well, I was the fastest person in the United States. Right. There's always somebody. And what's funny is eventually we did play Randy Moss and uh, there was another faster guy than all of us. So um you see, uh, there's always somebody bigger, better, stronger. But uh, what I saw was competition, hard work. I saw that you work on the system and then also in the system equally. Uh, and once you get up into a management level, it's coach versus player. It, it's not a coach trying to outplay a player. Your job is to get the fastest people on the field and make them all play off the same playbook and play for each other and not be a group of individuals, but a team, and then go kick ass. And tech was forming. Um, my dad didn't even know what the company was. He just knew that the stock went up you know, every year. Uh, so this was the original Silicon Valley. This was not uh, today a bunch of app developers and pajamas at home on a laptop. This is making the engine that 100% of tech runs off of, the microchip. Mm. And these were the the biggest, fastest, craziest things. And the dual core, the quad core, that enabled and unleashed a whole new series of things. And so we were with all the hardware companies. And software was really not that big a deal. But now apps and programming have come in and people think Facebook or uh, you know Instagram, they think those are tech companies. If you don't have a chip, it's like having an engine without a car. It's a stupid argument. So mm -hmm. tech is and always will be microchips first, then the hardware, and then the software. But people have these illusions that apps and the, the software is everything. If you don't have the device and you don't have the, the, the engine that makes a device go, uh, you're kind of a horse with or carriage without a horse or engine without a car. Um, so when I was there, I saw the meritocracy that you see in sports. Mm -hmm. I saw how to work together um, and very diverse group of teams, international people, all, all types of diversity, not like today, boy, girl, tall, short, old, young, black, white, not like that diversity, diversity in thought, diversity in perspective. And we were really challenged. And I had the discussion this morning with somebody uh, privately to have the mindset, how do I know that I'm not wrong? And how do I know with absolute certainty that I'm right? And you don't. And there's a lot of very smart people and smart comes in every shape and size, shape and form and everything. And it really challenged you to say, how do I know that I'm not wrong? Do I absolutely know that I'm not wrong? And it, when you look at stuff that way, 
you have more meaningful conversations. You're not shouting at each other. You're not waiting for your turn to talk. You're actually listening and you're trying to solve things that have never been solved before in tech. So uh, you have a lot of gifted people and you learn that there's a way, um, but it's not always the way. So you may have the greatest World Series of Poker Under Armour hat in the world and think that that's the only one. And I might pull one out from over here and put it on and it might be the same one. It might be worse. It might be better. But a lot of really talented people, just like in athletics or anything else, or people that have success, they're, um, they get fastest kid on their street syndrome and they don't realize that the world's always bigger. And when you think you know everything, there's going to be 10 little kids across the street um, that know how to use a Raspberry Pi and program Python better than an electrical engineer. Right. So this morning I had a conversation with a very, very, very special person in my life. And um, it was, how do you know with absolute certainty that you're not wrong? Or are you a hundred percent confident that your view, your angle, um, are you a hundred percent sure that you're right? And how do you know, how do you know that you are? Because if you're, if we're going to argue while trying to solve a problem, it's not productive and smart people don't talk like that. People with real brains will listen and they will solve a problem together, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how big our egos are, no matter how accomplished we are. And they will really listen, listen, listen and say, hey, let's face the same direction. We agree on the goal. Let's let's work together and talk through it. And uh, sometimes it's very frustrating because people share a common goal and they're just frustrated with the obstacles. Um, and Intel really taught me, took it from sports into the corporate world, and it reinforced true team stuff. If I am, uh, if I am a manager, if I'm a teammate, if I'm a, a husband or a wife or uh, you know whatever coach, it's really, am I really? If if you and I are a team, am I playing for you? Honestly, am I really playing for you? And are you really playing for me? Are you trying to get yours, be right, have the last word? And, uh, you know, if you don't like what I say, I'm going to throw a fit and take my ball and go home. That's most companies. That's most mm -hmm. business people. And the more and more successful people become, uh, you know, I know you've got tens of millions of dollars in your pocket. Uh, so maybe when I bump John the bomb up to hundreds of millions of cash in your pocket. You may think that you're a little bit better looking. You may think as guys, we might think that we're a little bit smarter, that we're a little bit more funny. We're not because you could take that money, light it on fire and it disappears. Money's not real. Uh, people are real. Relationships are real. And um, if you're not focused on people, specifically the people that are in your nucleus or your core and the people that you're working with to go out and you know, achieve world domination or the small win or have a great relationship with an employee or a person or whatever. It's people, 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 and then it's people and process. So if you're not focusing on people or process and you're worried about ego and all that silly stuff, I guarantee I'm going to kick your ass. If you're focused on anything besides getting the absolute best people on your team and having the tightest process off of the best benchmarks, I'll give you a hundred people first picks, but if, if you don't have your process and you're not focusing on the environment and the um, rules of engagement, if you will, I'll kick your ass every single time and I'll bet a farm on it. Hmm. Well, look, I mean, uh, earlier, uh, before we started recording, we talked about uh, jokingly a master class compared to an actual uh -oh. master's class. Yeah. Right? Yep. So, yeah. um, you know, wow. Uh, you know, the thing I could take out of that is, is a lot, there's a lot of depth there. Right. So let's go with culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you've been able to put culture in every business that you've developed or any opportunity that you've been a part of, but obviously it started with, you know, maybe the ingrown thing of, uh, of uh, athlete, you know, I'm an athlete myself and, yeah. and you notice that, right? Like uh, the great teams have that culture, right. Yeah. And it transitions into business. So, Give us a little bit of how, you know, the, the, the mile markers of culture. Is it, is it because the leadership developed the internal base and then the base got better and then it flourished everything else? Or 
how, how do you see kind of that deeper level of culture? If we could just go into that side. Yeah. Um, so somebody that I admire, emulate, and uh, I think the data speaks for itself and I'll use sports. Uh, you look at Nick Saban, hmm. Nick Saban, when wherever he was at, he has a standard and he has a process. And over the course of his career, he's taken the best people at his level uh, in coaching in business and whatever it is, he finds the absolute best and takes the bits and pieces that he likes from that and he incorporates it. And he's always learning and he's never arrived. He himself was at Toledo and won the Mac. Then he goes to Michigan state and wins a big 10. And then he goes to LSU when they're ranked a hundred something and wins a national title in a couple of years. And then he goes over to uh, Alabama. We won't mention the in-between silly NFL with all their punk. <laughs> I was going to say you missed yeah. that one. <laughs> no, I didn't miss it, but that's a difference in being yeah. coachable and uh, being a prima donna that gets paid too much money and has a hangnail and that's ego. So he goes back to college quickly truth. after, and uh, he's put in now as a fact, non-debatable, the most winning team in a history of any span of any coach in the history of football. He's put more first round draft picks consecutively into the NFL over any school. And he has more Heisman trophy winners. And that's all just under his watch. That's not the school. It's just him and his tenure at Alabama. So when you look that, when you look there, they have five star, five diamond, five, whatever recruits, but they're right for his system, his mm. process. And yeah, you know what? There's quarterbacks that might be a West Coast. There's ones that might be pro style, but he gets the one that fits his program and he recruits them. He sees the talent in them when they're 17, 18 year old or 16 or however old the, they start recruiting the kids. Um, and he gets, he does get the fastest kids on the field, the most talented, but more importantly, he gets the right ones on the team. He gets the wrong ones. I mean, one of the expressions that he you've heard him say before is, I get the right people on the bus. I get the wrong people, the F off of the bus. And then I figure out where to put the right people. And you look this year, who won the Heisman Trophy? His quarterback, mm -hmm. a sophomore. A sophomore quarterback won the Heisman. Um that doesn't happen a whole lot, uh, if ever. Um, so he, you look a couple of years before running back Heisman, another running back Heisman, another one Heisman. He produces Heisman's, Bolitnikoff's, uh, academic all Americans. Uh, mm. And then every year he puts six, seven kids last year, year before, year before defensive back, linebacker, lineman, line offensive lineman, defensive lineman, running back. He, 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 he puts first rounders every single year. And there was a neat stat that I was told um, is that there are, are exactly zero kids that under their four years of playing with him that do not have a national title rank. So if you're a mom and a dad and you bring your kid to Alabama, it is 100% certain based on the past that every kid he has ever had on a team has at least one national title ring. He, they're, they put five, six per year in the first round, not in the NFL, in the first round, he put mm. six guys in the first round. He puts even more into the NFL, but he, he puts them every year. And every single one of those teams has been ranked number one or two without exception every year that he's been a head coach down there. So his process, 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 and the people, 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 he does not get immature people. He does not get people that aren't headstrong and people expect a lot out of you because they think a lot of you. Mm -hmm. And so um, a conversation that I frequently have with very high performing people, probably the, the, the toughest, they say, I want you to go tough on me. I want you to give me full strength. And I always ask them, do you really want full strength or you want to be pandered to? Do you want to treat, you want me to talk to you like a little kid or do you really want full strength? And these are people who have always been the, the cool guy, the smart guy, the pretty girl, the popular this, the, the big executive. 
and you show them comps. You show them, if you're a soft drink company, you show them Pepsi and Coca-Cola. Or if you're a bottling company, you show them Anheuser-Busch or Coca-Cola or Rexam or whatever. Or you want consumer goods, you Procter & Gamble, you want tech, you, you show them Apple and Intel. You show them the comps and then when they start getting defensive and saying, well, you don't know how hard I work and they start making all the I statements, you then can go into that's a way and it has been successful. But if you are the benchmark, one, I wouldn't be in there. Two, you would be on CNBC making the stock market go up. You're not. So there's more work to be done. And ideally, I'm there to help you get there. And it's not because I coach or mentor or consult or run businesses the same. I have been very, 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 very deeply educated in psychology, um, professionally, negotiation by hostage negotiators. Uh, I've been trained in these things. So I understand probably at an abnormally scary rate how to see what's good and what's bad about people's styles, how long or short their fuse is. And if you're going to work with me up front, I have rules of engagement. And one of them is I, I don't need you to be the best, but I need you to be the best possible you. And if you look at it like a personal trainer, um, I'm going to guarantee nobody is going to outwork me. And in turn, I'm not going to have anybody outwork you uh, effort wise. And nobody's going to be more mentally prepared. No one's going to be more mentally prepared or physically outwork you, which is also a mental thing too. Mm -hmm. So when people want coaching, mentoring, consulting at, for, at bigger companies, um, I ask, do you want the real deal? You want full strength? And can you handle it? And often people will pout. They'll take it personal. They'll think you're being too emotional with them. But then they'll realize, no, you saw talent in a 17, 18 year old kid. And you said, I put enough 17 year olds on my team in my offense and they've won the Heisman trophy a national championship and gone on to be a first round pick. Whether you get what's being done to you or done with you, don't question the process. If you have a bunch of these and you have a bunch of banners and you can make concrete statements that without exception, every kid graduates, every kid goes to the NFL, every kid, this, every kid, that people start questioning 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. It's not an accident that that guy wins. You win it once mm -hmm. in a while. So it's very similar. And I'm not saying that, that I'm at that kind of a level in sports or something, but that's a person that a lot of people can relate to. They understand sports. So I'm going to use him as an example mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. because he went to Kent State University with my dad. So uh, I've got to see him over a very long period of time prior to Alabama. And he's been the same way. And he's just people in process. And he's a person that I very much admire. And right now you see a lot of people, 2019, 2020, 2021, they want to be entrepreneurs. They want to be business people. They want to be businessmen. They want to be business women. And there's frustration there because they emulate uh, what they saw at work. Well, most of these environments were piss poor environments. They had terrible culture, if it was culture at all. And it was more popularity. And there's science behind process. There's science behind best possible outcome. There's science behind predictive analytics. And guess what? I have a master's in quantitative analytics. So mm. you're not going to beat me on game theory. You're not going to beat me on stats and probability. And when you can accurately gauge talent that fits into a superior process, those people have to, right? The, 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 the young recruit, do you want to go to some other school and be the superstar and be, have your ass kissed and never win a ring and never win a banner, probably still go play in the NFL, but you're never going to be the best you in your developmental years. Do you want coaches that kiss your ass, tell you you're special, dance around your feelings or do you want to have a rough freshman year where you're working your ass off, but you know what an NFL standard is? You know what a team standard is? You know what the absolute best look, act, dress, and talk like? Well, the people that do that and say, you know what? They're not yelling at me to be insulting. They're yelling at me because they see something in me that I don't see in me. 
they're seeing something in me that my mommy and daddy never told me that my high school coach never told me that my boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, whatever, never told me. And some of it, you want it tough, you're going to get it tough, but it's going in there and it's in support. If somebody doesn't think anything of you, they're going to take you off the field. They're not going to coach you and you're going to go transfer schools. So it's a, in my opinion, it's a severe compliment when you get somebody that's been proven over a long time across many different playing fields or surfaces or uh, environments or industries, and they continue to make the people around them better. And they continue to win and put up numbers in bad situations, good situations, new situations, old situations. Those are the people that I want to be around. Those are the people I want to emulate. And with the people that I work with independently, like I was saying, uh, for the smaller entrepreneur, smaller business, <clears throat> as soon as they can drop that ego and that fear, it's usually fear and ego. It's one, one or the other, which kill everything. It's fear mm. that they're not good enough. It's fear that you're finally telling them all their insecurities out loud. It's fear that they're, uh, they're a me person and not a we person. And they're realizing that uh, they enjoy the mirror a little bit too much and they should enjoy the weight room a little bit more or running up and down the bleachers a little more versus buying the Lululemon pants and showing your butt off or buying a little Under Armour shirt and flexing your muscles. Um, the real good ones are always competing against themselves and they're competing against yesterday. And they're just, uh, they're, they don't give two shits what you and I are doing. They care about what they're doing and they're competing against themselves and they want to be pushed. They want to be uncomfortable. And there's people that say, I want to be uncomfortable being, or I want to be comfortable being, un being uncomfortable right now. Well, do you, I'll make you uncomfortable to the good, not to be a drill sergeant, but to the good. And you're going to push yourself through a lot of physical and mental limitations, stress for leadership. So we talk about leadership and culture. I train some of the highest end people in military and tactical, uh, corporate, small business, and actually athletics, uh, division one and, and high school athletics, but mostly division one sports, baseball, basketball, football, primarily basketball, football. The equation doesn't change. The egos, they all have the same egos. They're just, they come in slightly different formats. The personality types are all all the tests that everyone ever, all the tests everyone ever uh, took before, but um, it's never different. And the environments are never different. And the dance steps are always the exact same. And uh, when people can surrender that fear of responsibility, fear of pressure, ego that is unhealthy or unearned, or just fastest kid on your street or prettiest girl at your school or strongest guy in one gym. Um, you know, that those things. And I use that all the time because you have like the women and leadership stuff or, and they're like, well, I've always been pretty. So people do this. Well, I want you to be smart and be correct. I don't care if somebody likes what you look like in an outfit or, and you can emulate a, the bad qualities of a man. That's not being a boss lady. That's being bad qualities in men that you're emulating. That's not good. I want you to be strong. I want you to be a listener, an observer, a watcher. I want you to question, how do I know that I'm getting this right? Because ultimately, if you really want to be a leader, you're responsible for everything that goes wrong. You're responsible for every loss, every false snap or, or false start, every fumbled snap. It's all your fault. And it's all about the players and putting them into the league. It's putting the best product out. And at your company, it's about every single person that you have getting two promos in five years. It's about if it's not the right fit, you don't fire them, you develop them. You put your own personal time. You expect that out of your managers. And if they're not the right one, you don't just kick them off. They're human beings. You're going to say, you know what? If you gave me your best and you're not the right one for this system, I know another coach who runs a pro style. If we were on a West coast and someone runs a pro style and you're the pro style or whatever, I'm calling you up and saying, Hey, John, the bomb, I got the best quarterback in the country. He just runs this offense. That's what you run. I think it's a great place. He's studying the majors that you have. We should do a good transfer. There are coaches that do that. You see a lot of these guys. Uh, you saw Jalen hurts at Alabama 
stay all four years, have Tua go start in front of him after he was a Heisman candidate, uh, and then Tua won. And then, um, you know, then he goes over to Oklahoma and he did a pretty good job there. And they both play in the NFL now. So uh, that's what I think about culture. If it's people first and uh, you're able to, sometimes people just need, uh, it's a bad thing to say, but their egos are so big and so unjustified. And I'll say that 2021 has been very testing for a lot of people and they're looking in the mirror and it's different when you're on the company's budget and it's different when you're on the company's uh, expense account and and country club and uh, you know, you're, you're all high and mighty. And then you go out and you start your own business and you realize that people don't have to say yes to you. They don't have to laugh at your jokes. They don't have to open the door you have a very false sense of your ability because you're just used to being around rich people or you're used to being around whatever you're accustomed to this. Well, if you're real strong, little news, if you're 30, 40, 50 years old, and nobody has ever tapped you on the shoulder to go run their business, that means you're not a CEO. If you weren't even a middle level manager at your company, and then all of a sudden you want to take the heavyweight title and be CEO, you better look, act, dress, taste, smell, everything like one, or it's fake hype. And Mm -hmm. you see a lot of people in the gig economy right now. And instead of just saying, hi, I'm such and such, I'm, I own a small business, got a lot to learn and I'm trying my ass off. Will you help me? Uh, Instead of being honest, they're going to say number one, this number one, that best all time, this there'll be Instagram, fake hype pictures on Bentley's that aren't theirs. They'll, uh, the, the, the guys will flex and the girls will do the card. They'll all be mini Kardashians. And um, it's a world of fake hype. Uh, I think the entrepreneur, the best thing that the entrepreneur can do in the beginning, they talk about marketing and building an audience and all that. I don't need to build any audience. I need to make a real product that people like and then go show how it makes those people feel. So if I make World Series of Poker hats for Under Armour, I want to show you and all your friends having a good time, wearing the hat and playing good games of poker. At no point is it me with the hat on standing in front of a Ferrari with three string bikini models going, look how cool I am with uh, the Mr. T starter kit, you know, for jewelry. It's not that. It's about how do I put my product out in the market and have my people having the customers feel great about the product or service. So it's never about you, which is what everyone's doing on Instagram and everyone's doing on their websites. It's a, it's an illusion. And people, people know that Um, the followers, if, if you sold uh, metal, for example, uh, you may have to deal with some really tough old school people. If you are, you know, you buy steel as part of a product you make or aluminum, or as they say over in Europe, aluminum, you're going to have to go deal with people who might be from organized crime. You might have to deal with some of the hardest international people. uh, And then you might have a meeting within an hour at a glass factory that's making fiber optic stuff for tech. And then you may have to get the plastic from, you know, 3M, DuPont, Goodyear, whoever, but eventually you got to put together a car and the personalities, the types, you have to be able to legally and ethically play with every flavor of person and be able to um, do it in an ethical way and uh, be able to take the responsibility. Like I said, with the leadership of um, putting the team before you. And then the second thing is once you do have a team or you say, we do this, or I do this, when you make I statements and it's your company, no, it's always about showcasing the client. So if I look on Instagram, uh, I want to see everybody except me with my World Series of Poker Under Armour hat. Um, and I want to see you winning in, in, uh, in New York. I want to see somebody winning in LA. I want to see all of you guys going to Las Vegas with your hands in the air. I want to show that my product is on everyone. They enjoy it and they'll line up and buy a red one, a blue one, a white one, a green one. That's what I want to showcase. And people start out in the wrong mentality. It's the fake it till you make it. It's the build up the hype. It's look at all these little 
party tricks and illusions on social media. And then they go, well, if I get a bunch of followers, then I'll monetize it. There's only so many people that are actually making money that way. The real mm-hmm. people that make money either make, mine, move, or farm something. And that's never not been the case. The people whose names on the side of the building, that's usually what they do. They either make, mine, move, or farm something. If you sign the front of the check, you're a boss. If you sign the back of the check, you're an employee. Um, and people are also dishonest when they're they're doing these entrepreneurship things. And I'll use Clubhouse as an example, or I'll use any of these social audios that are hot right now. I know how much, and it's publicly available. You could go look at the Fortune 500 and get the top 100 highest earners in the world and see what their salary is. You could see what their base and bonus is. And if you dig a little bit, you can probably see their net worth. There are people in Clubhouse that are 20 years old and 30 years old that on a regular basis claim they have more money than the 100 richest companies on earth CEOs. It's just not real. You'll hear people say seven, eight, nine, ten, figure this. Well, maybe the business does that much, but you might get 0.000000 something percent or cents. And so really you're going, I made $1. So there's a lot of people that have fake life, fake hype, no results. And they're portraying an image that they think or was told this is what success looks like. Most of the people that I know that own the building, I'll give a great example. Roughly a month ago, two of the people that I respect the most professionally uh, will be nameless, um, but they're both billionaires and, and they've earned and employed entire cities uh, for years. You drive around in their car, they own one car that has 150,000 miles and it's 10 years old. Another one has a car, we're driving around 200,000 mile car. Uh, they probably cost 30, 40 grand maximum when they were brand new. And uh, that's fine because when we get out of the car, we're at a private jet center and we get onto their $70 million golf stream. Hmm. They're not wearing 20 pounds of gold. They're not in an Armani Brioni suit. They're not in skinny jeans and they really don't give two shits what you think about what they look because their name is on the building. Their initials are on the tail wing. They do get the door open for them. And they are the people that affect the tax base in an entire city or many cities. They are the people that go on CNBC. And if they have an off day, every person that has a retirement account either makes or loses money. So if they screw up and have an off day or make a poor decision, the NASDAQ drops 2% and effectively everybody on earth who's in the stock market, your net worth just went down by 2% because of what came out of someone's mouth. So Mm -hmm. these people, typically what I've seen, care very little about, and, and none of them really have social media at all, because when you're good, people take pictures of you. Michael Jordan has never had a, has never taken a selfie ever in his life. Michael Jordan does not walk around and sit in cars that aren't his, go to parties that aren't that he doesn't belong at. Um, a lot of the most successful people want to be left alone. They hold a very low profile. You're not going to find them on Google. You're probably not going to. Well, they're definitely not on social media because. They, the, the last thing they want to hear is, there she is, there he is. Oh, is that him? Oh, is that John the bomb? Well, if you're out in public, like you probably get, oh, is that John the bomb? Now you know it's going to be two hours of people asking you for autographs, and you'd rather go and then not be you, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the people that I've found to be most successful, and I'll use like the athletes, people buy tickets to see them. They don't sell tickets. They don't go out and hype themselves. Other people pay to see them play, dance, perform, sing, whatever it is. Business, same thing. Um, it's, it's the same thing. So social media has a purpose and they're great tools. But mm-hmm. when you go out and start a company and everybody goes straight to website and social, 
I don't need that. I need to make a great product. I need to have a great team. I don't need to throw money at the prop uh, at the um, at the problems. And I need to get the best people in my ear to work with or you know get trained by. I want the best speed coach. I want the best strength coach. I want the best dietitian. I want the absolute best people and I'll pay them whatever they want because ultimately it's going to come out in the product. And uh, I think that's a, a good, a better way to look at some of this entrepreneur stuff, especially when people, whether they want to be or not, they're, they're, they're going in the gig economy. So I would hope that's useful or I'd hope that I know everything I say and have said, everybody knew before I said it, they knew it probably before I was born. None of this stuff is, is new. And it's all timeless and stood the test of time. People, process, and uh, no fake hype. Uh, well, look, <laughs> I, uh, I've enjoyed that last uh, few minutes, you know, really kind of going deep. Uh, you know, we talked about culture, and then you talked about leadership. I had a chance just a couple of days ago to go to a local event. I didn't even know uh, that this guy, he, he founded a company called Dealer Inspire, and then uh, the, the, the event that's called, it's called refuel <clears throat> and mm -hmm. he had Jocko Willick there. So oh, he's talked the about, best. isn't, isn't yeah. he the best? He's, yeah, he, he's he ended, awesome. he was a keynote speaker, but yeah. <clears throat> you know, who blew me away yes. is, um, Amy Purdy. I think it was Amy Purdy is her name. Double amputee bronze winner, uh, Paralympic snowboarding. Oh, and wow. Yeah, she was incredible. Look her up, Amy Perter. Uh, and uh, she, so she went right before Jocko, which was intense because just her story was incredible. She got meningitis. I don't even know how to say meningitis. Yeah, bacterial meningitis. Yeah, yeah. yeah at, at 19 and was completely normal and lose both her legs, goes on a journey of 20 years. And now she's in her 40s and yeah. has done some exceptional things. And she teaches people, right? So I mean, I love what you talked about. And then you get Jock who talks about extreme ownership and, and really just development. So well, I love the ownership. What I like most about him, and I've met him before, mm. but he he um he is, I mean, he's the walking proof, he's the truth, he is a hundred percent the truth of the truth of the truth, and then mm. the way he delivers it. There's one of him. There's not 10 of him. There's one yeah. of him. There's people that are very similar or, but he himself, the yeah, accountability a lot of out there now speaking. Oh yeah, right? sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And everybody uh, uh, within the special forces, uh, they say, um, how do you learn how to balance the, the ball on your nose? And then they proceed to kick your ass if you ask them that question. <laughs> but yeah, you get, you get Delta force, you get seals, you get Rangers, you get spec ops, you get uh, Blackwater, you get, you know, you get all those people. Uh, but what Jocko, in my opinion, and very good observation, very massive, massive, massive fan and agree a thousand percent with him is the ownership and the accountability. Mm -hmm. If you don't have people that hold you to the highest standard of greatness, they shouldn't be your coach. And it doesn't mean they think that if you're not Michael Jordan, that you have to be Michael Jordan. But if they don't set the highest standards, and work the living shit out of you to get the absolute best out of you. And while you're sweating and while you're sore and you want to swear at them and kick and scream and moan, they don't take any of it. They take no lip. They take no mouth. They don't take any looks. They don't take any kindergarten level fits. They take your shit. They go harder and they make you the best. And when you come out the other end, Jocko can go make 10 more Jockos, but you and me can't make any Jockos. Maybe you can, but I can't. No, no, it's uh, it's an incredible thing. You know, and, you know, you think about <clears throat> as we, we bring it to kind of the, the, this community, you know, I, I feel like we're building a community of people that really are learning what it truly takes, right. To go for CEO, yeah. right. To, to understand the the grind and, and the work ethic and the leadership, the culture that you talked about. So yeah. can you give us some insight from your perspective? I know you you work with the top of the top, right? The 1% mm -hmm. of 1%. And you got to that I, level, right? By doing the right things and yeah. learning in the environment. And just clar in. clarification, <laughs> everyone will roll their eyes and vomit here, but that's an accurate statement. That's not a 
I'll pop no, this. no, that's, that's for not sure. A, that's not a pompous statement. You're not doing any puffery or foolery. That happens to be the lanes that I work in. It happens to be, and I'm proud of it. It's, it's, uh, I'm very proud of it. So, yeah. And you should. I mean, right. I mean, it, though, that's where, you know, having a little bit of a puffy chest is credible, right? Uh, and knowing that you know what if you it's know. true, it's true. If it's, it's true. true, it's true. I, I posted it something mean, on LinkedIn. It doesn't mean, yeah, it doesn't mean that you're trying to be fancy, but you know, if, if it's true, people should celebrate it, right? For sure. I mean, I just posted something on LinkedIn that said, uh, you know, when it's true, it's not, it's not boasting or so I forgot what it said, but you know, yeah, it's, it's not true, bragging. It's, it's not, it's not bragging. There you go. If, if it's the true, true it's right? not bragging. Yeah. Um, now, if he, now, if somebody is proud to share their accomplishments, like if we're in here and you're telling me about your stuff and I'm telling you about my stuff, it's not bragging. It's two great yeah. people sharing their stories. It's Tom Brady and Peyton Manning talking to each oh, other, yeah, or it's I mean, Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson and Kobe talking to each other. But uh, that goes back to that. Stories. Oh, yeah. Well, they always say that during the Olympics on the original Dream Team, they were blowing everyone out and they weren't getting any sleep at all which is crazy because you need all that recovery and all that sleep, but they didn't get it. And um, they still perform that high level, but they were so anxious to learn from each other. Um, and I could definitely talk about a clubhouse example. I could definitely talk about uh, somebody else uh, recently as well. Um, you know uh, that, that I've seen great entrepreneurship stuff and great inspirational stuff. Um, happy to talk about you so know, let, some of the let, stuff I've seen recently. No, let's let's take it to you know I think because just because of the audience is is very much I've interviewed uh, now over a hundred uh, oh. different founders and CEOs. But congratulations, that's awesome. I appreciate. It. I mean, uh, you know, Jason that's... Jimenez from Landing Big Whales, and mm -hmm. um, you know that was the hundredth episode. But you know, it's been just normal people in in you know in Elmhurst, Illinois running a $1.3 million company or $700,000 company. So it hasn't been the big dogs. And, and I did yeah, it, but it's the same, but it's the same, right? It's yeah. 100%, the same. 100%. Ultimately people will, will say this. I'll get this all the time. Well, I haven't done what you've done. I haven't done anything that they've done. You're constantly failing. You have the same a-holes, the same egos, the same things. They tell you, you don't understand. I'm different blah 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 all of this they kick bitch moan and scream and then in the end they're like how did you know that well because you've been there and you've been on that field and yeah. maybe somebody can just entertain the fact that you are older or you've been at every stadium you've had an at bat at every plate and you've seen all the pitchers throw all the pitches and all that can come with this time you can't just instantly yeah. be Barry Bonds and put it in the ocean every every third time you're at bat. Can't happen. No, impossible. So yeah. why why don't we take uh, a take a step into your world? If you go to work with someone that's about to launch, right? Yes. They've got that product. They developed themselves. They took the time to really understand the market, and uh, and really just say to themselves, "Okay, I'm ready." What are what are two three things that you really kind of know that are essential when you tap into that marketplace and you start to really build? I mean, I know you said people, right? So you you you've recruited the the right people, you've surrounded yourself with the right uh, talent, you've been able to do some uh, MVP stuff, right? Uh, and, and you you get to the point that you're launching because I think that's one thing with our community is we're we're always trying to teach in different industries how people got to that step. So what are some ways that you would say, if you take it down to the, the entrepreneurial side of starting a, a company that you would uh, really kind of develop someone? So I would, I would tell them what gets measured gets done. And I would say that um, the best measurement tool that stand that stood the test of time would be tying financial objectives to operational initiatives and the best tool that I know that's ever been used is we can agree that our report card ultimately is your P&L, your balance, all of that. We have the same report card. At a higher level, you report to shareholders. Mm -hmm. So when you report to shareholders, customers, whatever, again, at no point in time is it ever about you, ever. Um, so when they have financial objectives and they're tied directly to the point of activity, operational initiatives, 
you have to make sure that what you're measuring is meaningful, that everybody can look up and share a common scoreboard and know what, what, how much time's on the clock, how many timeouts they got, and what the score is. And if people don't know what success looks like, they're going to be all over the place. And that's real-time feedback. They can look up and see it. If they never look, that's fine. But at anybody at any given time can tell a good day and a bad day or what winning and losing is looking like. And if you have an organization, you're getting ready to do it, having that in place and that communication in place is key because people may think they're winning and they're losing. People may think they're doing a great job or even worse, people may work for months and have no clue what that review is going to be like at the end of the year. And it's, it's a mystery meeting. And that's probably most people in the corporate world. It's a mystery meeting. And then they're like, yeah, I, I think I'm either going to get promoted or fired. And there's nothing in between. You should definitely know what your review is going to be like if you work at a good company. So in turn, if you're at a company, starting a company, all the things that you didn't like, uh, being listened to, being heard, having feedback, uh, and then measuring the right things right, measuring meaningfully, um, that's all important. So putting those measurement systems in place and those scoreboards in place and the accountability, like you said, with Jocko in place, uh, that's key and that's instrumental because those habits will scale. If you're just lucky and then all of a sudden your dream order comes in and you need to double it, triple it, quadruple it, if you, have, if you build a brick shit house, it's going to scale. But if you build a shitty brick house, it's going to crumble. And most people uh, stand on a false foundation of fear and ego and vanity, and they lose. And there's a reason that there's only so many John the Bombs, right? There's a reason that there's only so many Elon Musks, or uh, there's a reason there's only so many uh, Natalia Lloyds over in London, or there's, uh, who, who else would be it? Like a, a Rogan podcast, or there's a reason there's only so many of the people that we admire in these segments it's because there's one of them. There's not 10 of them. There's one of them. And they stand on a very grounded foundation and they're very successful. And it's because they were, they, they, they just stand on the truth and the hard work and the ability and the God-given talent and little ego, little fear, massive results. So I would say encourage diversity, be a great leader, be able to measure meaningfully and keep score and uh, over-communicate over communicate, over communicate, and then um, share your wins and celebrate your wins and showcase your wins because people don't do that enough and tell people, thank you. Yeah, those are beginning steps that really are foundational, right? To everything that you're yeah. doing. So yeah. look, uh, Mike, man, uh, what an incredible journey. It's been really, really, I'm going to be uh, personally, I, I want to replay this and I'm, I'm very uh, humbled to be able to have recorded it because now it's a, a for me, I think just re repeating and kind of taking some really mental notes that I've already taken, writing this down, go for CEO community from a guy like Michael that has just shared some incredible wisdom. He's got some ties to some incredible people and just learned so much. And as he said, is always improving, right? Always growing, always getting better. Uh, what an incredible thing. So look, uh, we love to end the go for CEO channel interviews with CEO, right? So client experience, employee engagement and operational excellence, right? So there you go. <laughs> so there, there you go. I agree. Well, I appreciate it. You know, and, and it, it's interesting because all different industries, all different types of CEOs and founders that we've had on, and hopefully we'll have thousands to come. Yeah. Um, and part of the secret too, that we're trying to do is have you back every six to 12 months. So sure. we'd love to obviously learn more about your journey and in, in the next six to 12 months where Michael Giuliano is and what I'll you're tell doing. You, I'll, I'll communicate my goal for 2022. Okay. Let's so roll. Let's do it. Awesome. Barring COVID and the way the world is right now, one of my primary goals, my lead primary goal is to enter the UK market and start kicking ass in 2022. I was just there. I have a few opportunities. Like I said, I want a sincere opportunity to go over there, kick some ass, work with some great people, build a new team or enhance an existing team and see where it takes me. Uh, I've always dreamed of 
uh, living in another place and um, I've traveled the world and uh, that's somewhere where I'd like to go test it out. Uh, I was just there and it was fabulous. I'm going back there uh, hopefully sooner than later. And um, I know that there's a lot of opportunity over there for somebody like me who's in manufacturing, who's in product, who's in M&A. And while the world's standing still and it's starting to turn back on, uh, it's a new market that I have um, I've performed in well, um, but I've never set up a business, founded a business outside of the United States that is at the you know, the level of, of a UK or a Germany or something like that. So my new goal, we'll see if it happens. We'll also see if it's, it's even possible, but my goal six months from now is to even, you know, have to do one pound then 10 pounds then a hundred pounds and hopefully a thousand pounds and 10,000 pounds, a hundred thousand and a million pounds, uh, not dollars. And we'll see. So, uh, we'll see what it holds. And I think we got, um, Let's see, we got uh, two weeks left and uh, clock starts ticking. So uh, we'll see, uh, again, uh, try to take all the excuses out. If any of your listeners live in the UK, uh, holler at your boy, hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, and I'd love to do work. Uh, so uh, I've got a German connection of a recent one that uh, they're doing some big things. Actually, just uh, the president in the United States, the 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 local one just went to SpaceX. So he was telling me oh, about wow. his visit at SpaceX. He said it was ridiculous. So it's awesome. Yeah, I'm, brother. Fr- I'm, I'm, friends to- with, I'm friends with their launch manager. Uh, and uh, those guys are literally rocket scientists. So they're they, doing, uh, yeah. and they're doing it a different way. Could you imagine that a person made PayPal, then went and made Tesla and then <laughs> kicked NASA's ass to outer space. And the team that, he's had in place and the teams that he continues to build the level of talent to be able to kick nasa's ass privately wow so yeah. if they're over at spacex holy moly <laughs> yeah they're selling machines to spacex these guys that are clients of mine so yeah, yeah man love to introduce i'd love to be a part of that journey too and, and if there's any small way that i could you know help propel that or any connections i have uh, you know, certainly excited. And the declaration of what you just did is pretty awesome. Something to learn from Go for CEO community that if you declare your intention uh, and put it out there, it already puts a little bit of heat on your ass, right? Because now you have it out here and it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be <laughs> out I'm there. Gonna that- t- I'm going to tell you right now, write down your goal, communicate your goal publicly. Mm-hmm. And now you have a million people to hold you accountable. But if you don't write them down and you don't, communicate them uh, a goal without a plan is a wish so a wish. yeah i love it i love it so let's let's end the the interview as we traditionally do and i'd love to get your perspective just from a from a value level right uh, so when you think about c right client experience and all the endeavors that you've had the entrepreneurial things or even the 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 mastery and consulting that you do for fortune 500 companies what what is one or two nuggets that when you think about a, an entrepreneur, a business owner, someone that's just building something could really say to themselves, hey, if I key in on this client experience, how do I make it so valuable that I become different than the other people? So what is one or two thoughts? I'm going to say it's this simple. And in my opinion, I would go toe to toe with anybody that has a better answer. You need to ask the client or customer, how do you measure success? Because what you're making or what you're providing may be great, but that may not be what makes our eyebrows go up. So um, if somebody thinks that profit is what it is and they want impact, those two aren't the same. If someone thinks it's high volume and they're making bespoke handmade custom things, their goals aren't the same. Uh, So how do you measure success is probably the first question that everybody, if you don't know it, you cannot have that C answer there. Understanding how do you measure success and then listening. So uh, it's what Andy Grove used to say a very long time ago. He said, the customer experience is like sex. You ask them what they like, you give them what they like. And if they don't do it, you ask what you need to work on. And if you get better, then they'll like it. 
if you do what they say two times and they don't like it, maybe they're crazy and you should stop working with them. <laughs> so fire bad customers. I love it. I love it. So next one is employee engagement, right? Uh, you know, you've talked about it uh, numerous times on this uh, podcast here that, you know, you recruit the right leadership. Uh, yeah. But then that means that they have to then develop their own teams as well, right? So yes. you've recruited the right people, but how do you keep, keep them engaged, right? Like what, what's a couple of nuggets there of just employee engagement? People have these strategy sessions and they're not, like I said, you have financial goals, you have a company. The point is to make money and to make money, you have to generate revenue. You have to pay everybody well, meaningfully, treat them nice, treat the customer great. And it's about your employees and your customers and then have the profit. Uh, so if you're not engaged, that means you don't know the score of the game. You don't know if you had a good or bad day or week or month or quarter or year. You're measuring meaningfully and fact-based. So no one's living in a fantasy world and you celebrate your wins. That's a feedback loop. Uh, and you take care of the people. Some people, uh, you may say something and it's the, there's no crying in baseball, right? Tom Hanks tells him hit the cutoff and the girl cries and it's the end of the world. And later on, he comes out in that famous scene where he's shaking. He said, I would like you to work on hitting the cutoff person before next season. And then the, the, the you know, the young lady says, Oh yeah, it's great. You know, they get it. Everybody needs to be talked to, uh, you know, how they like to give and receive communication and feedback, but they also have to know, that when you're on the team, part of the job is if you F up, you need to be accountable and people are going to yell. You are going to have very hard conversations, but that's part of working hard, not bad, you know, illegal ones or unethical ones, but you're, you're going to have to sweat. You're going to get sore. It is going to hurt. And if you're going full speed, you're going to be very sore. Uh, but it builds toughness. It builds resilience and, uh, and eventually you build, you build champions in the champion system. Love it. All right. So look, you know, that analytical statistic masters, I mean, just incredible Intel background, like all this stuff comes down to operational excellence. Like what can you give us a couple of high value statements of when you think about starting to implement that business or you're a year, two, three years into it, what are some checkpoints for operational excellence? I think it's funny to hear that because I used to own opex.com and I'd put in operational excellence programs across the world. So funny that the question's phrased that way. And that's stuff that I actually teach and do at universities is mm -hmm. that exact word or are, are those words teaching teachers how to teach that. And then that goes to you know, eventually makes it out to the real world. Uh, so operational excellence, um, it's understanding where you are against a benchmark. It's the, like Lexus says, the res, re, uh, relentless pursuit of perfection. It's in the dailiness. Um, it's not hitting home runs and, you know, people have these five run homers, I call them. There's no such thing as a five run homer. There's only a grand slam. And to hit a grand slam, you got to have all the people on base. And to have all the people on base, you need all the singles, doubles, and triples. And then someone has to have all of that happen and then hit it out of the park, literally hit it out of the park. Um, so you, you have to have these realistic goals. And it's more about the dailiness. I want the 1% better every day versus 1% um, less. And you could do the math of, uh, you know, 1.01 1 .01 to the 365, you know, power, and you can do a 0.99 and you can see that the difference is several orders of magnitude different and just go 99 versus 1.01 1 .01, uh, or 1.01 .01 versus 0.99 to the 365th. Uh, it's an easy calculation for the listeners. Do it and say, if I just spent one, one, one percent better every day, if you have, uh, you know, 14, uh, what is it? 1440 minutes uh, in a day, something like that. And you spend 1%, that's what 14.4 minutes. So if you spend 15 minutes a day getting better at something, it could be education. It could be working on your craft. It could be your health. It could be your sleep. 
We all have the exact same amount of time every day. It's how you use it. You're either busy or productive. And that's another thing. Most of these entrepreneurs and most people in general could not honestly, legitimately tell you the difference in busy and productive. It feels good to be busy. I worked so hard. I did all this stuff. I spent this money. You don't understand. It took me years. Well, if it did, that's fine. But if there were 10 other people and you didn't bother to look, ask, or emulate, and it's publicly available, then you're just stupid. Or your ego is beyond belief. No, no reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, but again, people, uh, their, their, their ego is so big and so unhealthy. And the social media is really killing people because they're giving them such a false sense of how special they are, how unique they are, how connected they are. And if you turn the internet off, the true measure of talent is going to be when the electricity is off. Can you go repeat what you did? Are you calculator dependent? Are you laptop dependent? Are you iPhone dependent? Are you social media dependent? Because until about 15 years ago, the whole world conducted business without any of these devices. And you see now a lot of people are unplugging and a lot of people are going back to pencil and paper. Um, so uh, the operational excellence, there's value and simplicity. What gets measured gets done. And you have to measure the dailiness at the right granularity. And at the end of every day, somebody has to understand if they had a good hour, a good shift, and the team had a good day. If they don't know what the scoreboard is and you're not measuring success to the shareholders and the team, you will lose. You may get lucky and win, but overall, you're going to lose. <laughs> Should get some, uh, some dropping bombs. Uh, you ever uh, heard Brad Lee's podcast? He's got the... Uh... Cool, uh, cool thing. So awesome, brother, man. Hey, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, we, we've seen each other, we've talked, we've been on stages together in Clubhouse and obviously humbled when you, uh, when you were uh, willing to share your phone number with me and uh, I uh -oh. won't tell anybody else. So give it um, out to the masses. <laughs> well, here, that, that's one thing uh, we like to end too with is, you know, I know that people seek you out, uh, yeah. you know, but what that, are some, that might be, that might be a little tough. I, I don't really have anything besides LinkedIn. Uh, okay. No so LinkedIn is the best way, right? If you could find another way, God bless you. Cause, uh, <laughs> there's no website, there's no business card, uh, none of that. LinkedIn is, you know, spell That's my name it. right and go find it. And, uh, you know, well, happy I, to help or connect any way that I can. You might see me around Clubhouse uh, temporarily here and there, but yeah, LinkedIn face to face and uh, or eventually telephone face to face. That's the only way that business has been done for thousands of years, and uh, it's the only way I operate. So, I love it. I love it. Well, hey, you heard him. LinkedIn. That's where we find this gentleman. Uh, what an honor to uh, have had you on the Go for CEO channel. Thank you so much. Uh, as we grow this channel and and attract, you know, the talent, uh, around the world. Uh, we just had a impactful interview with a gentleman out of Australia. He's wow. in the finance game. So it's really cool to have, I've had one in Ireland and one in Australia and, uh, you know, it's opened up the doors with different areas. So really cool stuff, brother. Uh, any last words that you want to share? Uh, you mentioned Australia and, uh, there's somebody that this year very much inspired me, uh, in a meaningful way. And I think um, she has a very bright future. So uh, her name is Kat Birch, uh, Birchley. And she was in a horrific crash, a mm -hmm. uh, bus crash. And she had her skull fractured, her jaw fractured, facial features fractured. She had fractures in her arm, the whole length of her arms. She had fractures in cracked ribs, spine. Most people would, their, unfortunately, their, their, you know, their mind, their bone structure, their movement. Most people that experience a wreck or a bus crash, you, you're not even supposed to be alive after you break that many things. Hmm. Somebody like that has had a very long road to recovery, physical recovery, but also probably mental recovery as well. And you see today that she is, um, her bones have healed, her jaw, her 
everything is healed. And she has gone from somebody who probably was supposed to, I mean, I don't know, you break all those ribs, you break your jaw, you break your skull, you break your face, you break your arms, your, your back, you break, you break all those things. You're not supposed to be doing salsa dancing or, or uh, Zumba or doing that. You're not supposed to have that type of coordination. You're not supposed to be able to do that. And that was one of the ways that she recovered from a very, very tragic event. And now you see somebody like that, that was able to persevere, told you can't do this. You won't be able to do that. Bullshit. Physically doing it, enjoying it, and used dance as therapy and music as therapy and uh, is has a really great story to tell. And um, I, uh, you, you talked about Australia. I first heard about her from one of my friends that's a basketball coach over there and said there was, you know, uh, a young person that was in a, a horrific bus accident. And, you know, the, you know, I just, it's a friend told me about it. And then a little bit later, I saw that person on LinkedIn and they were telling their story about how their recovery went and how they went viral talking about it. And now I have, um, uh, now I have a, a, a friendship with that person and uh, that person's inspiring all kinds of people. It could be army vets uh, who have been in catastrophic injuries. It could be old people who their body is breaking down on them. It could be people have surgery, uh, but you see so many people, whether it's mental or physical obstacles, and you usually see like these real big tough guys talk about war stories and war heroes and, and athletes talking about this and whatever. Very rarely do you ever see a, a young person, female, give that impactful of a story that there's pictures to prove and there's medical stuff to prove. It's not some guy sprained his knee in the NFL and had a hundred million dollars and then poor them. This is a regular person who is young and most people don't have the perseverance, the mental strength. They don't have that. And uh cat definitely has that. And uh, I would think that uh, you, well, uh, I'll, I'll tip, I'll tip it a little bit. You probably will hear a lot about this person and you will probably see a lot of this person sooner than sooner than later because the story's very big now and uh, it's neat. And for young people to be able to persevere and, and have that mental strength and then not just be another army guy, I'm not saying that, that, that that's wrong, but the, the stereotypical big guy break something, sports, military, leadership, mental resilience, to have a young person and a female go through something a hundred times worse than any athlete ever went through. And the odds of your brain, your spine, your, you know, just everything, your, your, your jaw, your being able to talk and then say, yeah, here's, here's a picture. Now here's a, uh, here's what they're doing now. If that doesn't uplift people, I don't know what will. And I think that'll be one of the biggest stories in 2022. Uh, and, and watch out. Uh, there's probably going to be somebody from Australia uh, in 2022 that uh, becomes bigger than life. And uh, I hope people like that um, are able to tell their stories and get them out. And um, it's, just, it's just a really neat story. And it's very heartfelt. Well, I'd love to have her on. You know, I mean, obviously, everything that is developed uh, has that go for CEO mindset, right? Uh, when you can develop yourself and get through things, it's uh, that's part of the journey of go for CEO and why I thought of that, uh, hopefully as, as something that inspiring. So awesome, brother. Thank you so much, man, for being a part of this. Uh, looking forward in the next six to 12 months uh, to see you in the UK blowing up. And hope so. uh, hope I'm, I'm going we'll I'm gonna, cross, I'm gonna cross hold you to it, man. We're going to hold you to it, man. So I know you're going to do it big time. So awesome stuff, man. Thank you so much, Mike. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody, if you're still awake and you didn't fall asleep or you didn't vomit, thank you for listening and uh, Godspeed and kick ass in world domination next year. Boom.